On behalf of our Green Living Committee, I want to welcome you to Where Do My Greens Go, a webinar to answer your questions about home composting and Orange County's organic waste management. And just want to quickly thank the team that put this together. The co-chair of our Green Living Committee is Jocelyn, who did that wonderful um, land acknowledgement. And um, Suzanne Tanney is going to be our facilitator and uh, keep us on track with our very ambitious agenda. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm just going to give a, a very quick uh, introduction on the environmental impacts of organic waste and Senate Bill 1383. We then have a speaker to um, help us with home composting, uh, followed by um, your questions. And then we have representatives from uh, two of our major waste management companies in Orange County who are going to discuss implementation of SB 1383. And um, in order for um, us to get to all of our speakers, we're going to ask you to please type your questions in the chat and then Suzanne is going to present them to the speakers during the Q&A segments. Next slide. So our speakers today will be Tom Polly from EcoNow California, Mike Carey from CR&R Waste Services. Next slide. Debbie Killey and Nina Walker from Republic Services. Next slide. So uh, why is a group that um, focused on um, climate change um, so interested in uh, organic waste in landfills? And um, I also wanted to mention that the Green Living Committee has been working on this subject uh, for a while, and um, this is actually our second webinar on the topic. The first one was in uh, spring of 2022. Um, so the reason is that 20% of the state of California's methane, um, a, which is a climate super pollutant, 84 times more potent then carbon dioxide is emitted from organic waste and landfills. It also emits air pollutants like particulate matter, which can lodge in your lungs and contribute to health conditions like asthma. Next slide. Organics, which includes food scraps, yard trimmings, paper and cardboard, make up half of what Californians dump in landfills. And reducing short-lived climate super pollutants like organic waste will have the fastest impact on the climate crisis. And this information is from the Cal Recycle website. Cal Recycle is the lead agency uh, responsible for implementation of SB 13. 83. So they have a lot of good information on their website if you want to do more reading and want to join California's climate food fight. Next slide. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, no. No? Uh-oh. Let's see. Is that it? Nope. Or one more? There we go. Okay. So um, California has been uh, blazing the trail as we often do uh, legislatively. Um, on the federal level, the US EPA has been primarily focused on educating the public about wasted food. And 
EPA estimated that in 2019 alone, about 66 million tons of wasted food were generated in the food retail, food service, and residential sectors. And most of this waste, about 60%, was sent to landfills. So just recently, they published this um, wasted food scale that kind of ranks preventing wasted food as you know the top solution and um, then putting it in landfills um, is, is the worst. And the additional benefits that we get from uh, keeping wasted food out of landfills is um, the very important feeding of hungry people, uh, conserving natural resources and supporting a circular economy. Next slide. But we can't, of course, eliminate all um, all food. We will always have, um, you know, some food scraps, the peels and and bones and such, as well as our um, yard waste. So we need to change um, how we manage uh, uh, organic waste in general. And so Senate Bill 1383 was signed into law in 2016. It had very ambitious goals to reduce organic waste disposal by 75% by 2025 and to divert at least 20% of the food, the surplus food that was currently being disposed of to people in need. And again, this uh, goal by 2025. Next slide. So a lot of people, um, you know, comment that, you know, it's like, wow, you know, SB 13, 1383 has been around for, uh, you know, since 2016. Um, you know, why don't I, you know, have, uh, um, you know, why can't I put my food scraps um, in the green bin yet? Uh, but it has been a major, major shift in how California um, manages its waste. And, but we've made significant progress 75% of communities report they have residential organic waste collection in place. That's 464 out of 616 jurisdictions. And 100% of communities have expanded programs to send still fresh unsold food from large food businesses to Californians in need. California now has 206 organic waste processing facilities and is building 20 more. CalRecycle has made significant investments in uh, SB 1383 infrastructure through grants and loans. Next slide. So that's it for my introduction, and I'm happy to uh, hand the mic over now to Tom Pauly, and you can check out his um, bio there as we get him online. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, you can see a little introduction of myself. My name is Tom Pauly. Uh, I work at Eco now. Uh, it's a local zero waste refill store focused on zero waste lifestyle, which includes uh, organic recycling. Um, we've been certified by Green Business Network at two of our three locations in OC and uh, Laguna Beach and Costa Mesa and working on Anaheim. And we did receive a uh, innovator status at our Laguna Beach location because of our uh, organic waste recycling practices we do in store and also our gray water waste recycling um, practices we do in store. That's a separate topic. But yeah, uh, next slide. Yeah, and then you can see um, we regularly do compost classes uh, in the community. Uh, that pictured here is me at Cal Poly Pomona talking at their uh, Lyle Center for Regenerative Studies. Um, 
Next slide. Thank you. Yeah, so it's just cool um, to think about organic waste recycling. And I think Senate Bill 1383 uh, really got people thinking about it more and practicing it more, probably more passively by uh, diverting, separating their waste in their house and use, using municipal systems. Uh, but my objective and focus today is to talk about how you can do it in home, uh, to be a little more independent on municipal systems and easing the burden on city recycling services and also just making it fun and practical. Like if anyone's visited our stores before, you've probably seen a pickle jar filled with dirt in it. That's actually a living terrarium full of red wiggler composting worms eating our store trash, which is already minimal, but it's cool seeing uh, how we recycle our shredded paper and our food waste and use tea leaves, stuff like that just in front of you as soon as you walk in. And it's a living uh, thing with soil and composting. There's bunch of bacteria in there. They say uh, a tablespoon of uh, compost tea has over a billion micro living beneficial microbes in it. So um, there's some benefits there when you could create liquid fertilizer from it, reuse you your waste as soil. So you pretty much have a regenerative farm in your house when you practice that. And then also uh, it's a natural antidepressant. Um, there's this thing called mycobacterium backache which releases serotonin in the brain. Um, so I think that's why when people go out and they garden, they get their dose of vitamin D, they get uh, the mycobacterium vacuum, and you get a euphoric feeling doing that. So it makes sense how natural it is and why it feels good. Uh, and the thing is dirt is dead. So it's not to be confused with like dirt you see on trail paths, you know, it's compressed, it's dried out. There's no living things in there. It's not usually as black looking more grayish and um, and when you think about your house as like California's landfill uh, per cow recycle, 30% of California's landfill is organic waste. And when you, when you start composting at home, you could divert a third of your home's waste just by composting. Um, and like we were talking about earlier, the byproduct of throwing organics into landfills is that decomposes as methane. I know OC waste does a good job collecting the methane to reuse as energy for homes, but I think I always like the more independent approach and keeping things in house. Uh, next slide, please. So what is vermicomposting? I like vermicomposting because it's fast, it's minimal. Like I was saying earlier at our stores, you could see it being done in little pickle jars. All you really need is red wigglers or there's these other cool variations of worms, um, but I, I like the red wigglers the most. Uh, and you just need a container to keep them in and feed them uh, following what's natural that you see in the environment. I like to use the analogy of an apple tree. I know apple trees aren't as native to California, but uh, you know, like just fruit trees in general, when you start seeing in the summer when fruits uh, are reaching the end of their hang time, they hit the ground and that you could think about the ground as like your home compost bin. Um, that's all the green waste, right? It's uh, like fruits, vegetables, banana peels, coffee grounds, stuff like that. And then when fall comes, the dried leaves hit the ground. So that's carbon, you know, it lights on fire. So it's brown materials. And then uh, in turn, the worms use the carbon to help break down the green material. And then the byproduct is that soil. Uh, worms are great because they eat half their weight and waste per day and they could live up to five years and they reproduce fast. So they go from cocoon to adult in just a matter of a couple months. Uh, next slide, please. And what can they eat? Like I was just saying, um, they need that combination of brown material and green material. That's just an easy way of saying the brown material is carbon and the green material is nitrogen. Uh, what is carbon material? Stuff that could light on fire, essentially. Dried paper, brown, or uh, brown materials, uh, cardboard. Usually you want brown material because there's a lot of bleach and dye and um, like white paper and stuff like that. But I've noticed worms can adapt to that and they'll eat that too. You just want to avoid glossy paper because that's lined with plastic. It won't break down. Um, the worms won't eat it. Uh, and even with inks too, it's soy based. So worms can eat that too. I, I normally don't really worry about that. Um, 
green materials, breakfast foods are best. So it's always fun composting after you've had some coffee. Uh, food scraps, watermelon rinds, banana peel, apple cores, coffee grounds. Uh, you want to limit acidic materials like citrus, onion, and acidic foods because um, the pH and the worm bin. Kind of want to think about it like your stomach too. Like you don't want to put things that will upset your stomach. So yeah, uh, acidic foods you want to avoid. And no meat, dairy, grains, or oils. Imagine the worms as being vegan. They don't want to eat that. They technically could eat all that, but their stomachs can't process it that well. And usually the pathogens and bad bacteria will swarm in and then make your bin an unhealthy environment. And then um, other animals can also compost. A lot of people like to have chickens. Uh, they, I've practiced black soldier fly composting. But the thing I like about worms is they stay worms. They stay underground. They're out of sight, out of mind. You know, and you're actively composting at that time. Uh, next slide, please. Some stigmas are odor, pests. Um, I think I think if you balance a worm compost bin, this is why we have it in the store to reduce that stigma. Like right in front of you, as soon as you walk in, you're carrying your containers to refill products to avoid plastic waste. So you could use consumables that are uh, compostable. Um, you don't smell garbage when you walk in our stores. You smell really nice smelling products and you smell like earthy living soil from the uh you know, mycobacterium and compost jar. Um, pests, if you, as long as you keep it sealed, there shouldn't be any like critters breaking in. And then um, the other things is like fly, flies will turn into flies and maggots. And if you keep, maintain the balance, you won't have pests growing in there. And you can see that in our stores. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and then you can learn more by attending future classes. I mean, what I gave you today was a nice uh, summary and paraphrasing of everything we go over. But I just want to reduce the stigma of like at home composting being a daunting task. I think worms make it really achievable and practical because, like I was saying earlier, you just need a, any container to store them in. Start layering two parts brown material, at least to one part green material. So more brown material, the merrier. I wish I had that terrarium jar on, on hand right now to share, but um, I just load up a bunch of shredded paper in there. And when you think about it, less surface area for the worms to work with, the better. They'll eat it faster. Like I sometimes make worm smoothies out of my breakfast foods where I just add a little bit of water and blend up all that uh, like green waste garbage together and feed them that. And just sprinkle like two parts uh, shredded paper or cardboard, egg cartons, you know, so that's why breakfast foods are great. And then, uh, yeah, you just want to maintain that ratio. More browns in America because browns won't rot. They're just carbon, you know, they help absorb and they keep a balanced bin. And whenever I try to troubleshoot a compost bin, like if it gets too wet or acidic, uh, just more browns the merrier. And yeah, you could even practice this at home. You could just bury your trash following that lasagna method and see what kind of bugs come eat it. I don't think like, uh, like uh, local earthworms break down things as fast as like red wigglers. So you probably want to try to get some red wigglers either from us at Eco now or find your own source too. And then um, we do have a lot of tools in store, like our free compost classes, our starter worm compost bins, which I upcycle from our closed loop buckets. Uh, we have more heavy duty worm compost bins, which are kind of, you know, uh, you don't have to think about it much. It, it's really works really well. Collector bins too, and then refillable organic, plastic free, home health and beauty products, just so you could avoid needing to compost anything altogether. Because um, every all you're just avoiding trash by doing that. Yeah. So, does anyone have any questions? Um, I'll put my email in here in case we run out of time. But feel free to chime in. Any questions, you can um, put them in the chat or you can just uh, say them. We've got, yeah. we've got about five minutes allocated if uh, anyone wonders. You answered my questions about where to get the worms. You've got the worms. That's awesome. Yeah. And I know, I know I've been to your Costa Mesa store so many times and never noticed the green pickle jar. So I can't wait to go back and check it out. And if you haven't been um, to that store in the anti-lab Costa Mesa, it's, it's awesome.
So I highly encourage you to do that. Thank you for your kind words. Yeah, it's kind of fun in that store. More you look, more you find. And when you go back, you're going to see the pickle jar. You won't realize it was right in front of you, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, Lisa's question is, having trouble getting my eggshells to compost? I'm not currently using worms. Would that help? Yeah, I think if you just sprink, um, you know, I like to keep things focused on eco now, but honestly, you could source red wiggler worms uh, in a lot of places. Uh, I think I just like the ones I breed because they're used to eating trash. They're not like water filled, you know, uh, living in cocoa core type worms. They, they are pretty strong. I like to think they're like jailhouse worms. But um, yeah, eggshells, I think you want to grind it up. Eggshells aren't really carbon or nitrogen, they're calcium, and they're used that you could grind up eggshells and use as grit, which worms love because they that grit helps them break down green material just like the carbon does. So that's kind of how you make grit out of the eggshells. So crushing it up, they'll they'll turn it and they may not digest it, but it'll make them want to eat more. Uh, any other questions? I just have, this is Danny, I just have a comment. Um, yeah. um, I read recently that if you put a little sand in your compost where the worms are, they actually, it helps them, they'll eat the sand and bring the sand into their mouth and then it helps them grind the uh, material. It's like teeth. They don't really have teeth. So the sand helps them, you know, form some teeth. Yeah, so it's just like, uh, like yeah, the sand is like grit. It's um, another way you could use grit to help them digest items. So uh, you could even regenerate, like if you have sand in your yard, uh, like make that into living soil too. Yeah, thanks for the, mentioning that because yeah, grit like uh, really helps them chew and break things down. And then uh, Jocelyn mentions having a lot of bad bananas. How do Worms do with peels. They love peels. They love peels. They love rinds, um, like watermelon rinds, um, apple cores. Those are like their favorite foods. So if you're trying to like really repopulate a compost bin with worms or just jumpstart it, I would give them those as their favorite foods. And then you can start putting in things that they may not necessarily like, just so you could be zero waste. Like I, I honestly put like uh, lemon peels and orange peels in there. But uh, because there's so much brown material and stuff they like, it really keeps the pH balanced in there. So you could get a little experimental with it. I would just avoid any animal byproducts because those do bring pathogens. Uh, any other questions? I think we have a couple minutes for the Q&A left. Yeah, um, Tom, question. Uh, is there like an optimum number of worms? Like for a, I don't, I don't have a sense of how many you need. Yeah, I'd say you want to start off with like uh, about a pound. You can honestly start off with any amount you want. It's just they, it takes time for them to repopulate. I'd say if every two months you want to check periodically to see if the population is good or if you even start, see after two months if the population is growing because that's when they go from baby to cocoons. And uh, they're technically an invasive species, so they'll repopulate like crazy. Um, yeah, I'd say any amount you could start off with, just make sure you don't overfeed so it doesn't rot. And I think the optimum is amount is like uh, about a pound of worms, which would be around 750 to 1,000 of them. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. but I usually give away, like, I don't even really count the worms at my classes. I just do a handful because I know there's babies and eggs in there. Just throw them in there, feed it right, and the bins are kind of uh, self-explanatory. So, you know, they'll adapt. They're very adaptable. And I heard they can actually live in your house, right? Or do most people keep it outside? I have a friend who has hers in her house, so I was wondering you about that. Yeah, you can. Uh, it's just, you just worry about fruit flies mostly, but I don't even make ventilation holes for my bins because um, you don't really need them. It just attracts the flies. But if you put that layer of paper, it'll, the flies won't breed on it. And uh, yeah, you can do it in house. I've done it in my garage before and I forget I even have it in my garage and I go back and everything's eaten. So it's oh, pretty wow. cool seeing that. All right. So I think perfect timing um, and we're out of questions. So Tom, thank you so much. This was super cool. And I can't wait again to see those uh, worms. All thank right. Thank you. 
So um, we're going to shift focus now to talk about the implementation of 1383. And we're excited to have speakers both from uh, Republic Service and CRNR um, to tell us more about how the implementation is going and let us know really, I think, how we all can help with that adoption. What can we do to help? Because, you know, we've heard a lot already and we'll continue to hear how important it is for our air um, to get uh, to keep the methane out. Um, so let's start first with um, Debbie Keeley and Nina Wachter. I um, hope I'm not butchering your name. Welcome uh, to tell us a little bit about what's going on with Republic Services. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for having us tonight. I'm very excited to talk to you guys about 1383. Uh, my name is Nina Wachter. I am from Republic Services and I'm a sustainability advisor there. So we can get to the next slide. Yes, and another slide. So just a little bit about our company. We are a nationwide company and we have some um, nationwide recognition, recognition from um, some awards that we've gotten, including a great place to work, a certified great place to work. Next slide. These are the cities that we service in Orange County. So we have two different business units. We have the Huntington Beach business unit and the Anaheim business unit. I work um, for the Huntington Beach division and these are their respective cities that they service. Next slide. So SB 1383 is a very complex piece of legislation. It has six individual pillars um, that, that go towards it. So one of those being providing organics collection services to all businesses and residents, establishing edible food recovery programs. So this means that we're doing outreach to the businesses that are generating a lot of food waste, typically restaurants, and coordinate, coordinating with them if um, they have a lot of recoverable food at the end of the day, at the end of the week, that they can set up donations um, for, for places that collect it and, and um, distribute it, as well as conducting education and outreach, um, procurement and recyclability of the recovered organic products. Um, this means that we are actually utilizing the material that we are generating and um, recycling. So an example of this would be how we have um, compost giveaways for residents in the community. And this is the, the product that's been created from the, the things that they are um, putting in their organics bins. Uh, we also have securing access to recycle, recycling and edible food recovery capacity and monitoring compliance and conducting enforcement, which I will talk a little bit more about later. Next slide. So what are organics? Um, Lisa already touched on some of this, so I'll just quickly go over. It's food waste, green and yard waste trimmings, untreated wood waste, cardboard paper, and food cell paper. Um, one thing to note about this is I get a lot of questions about the cardboard um, because technically it is an organic material. However, if there is clean cardboard that's not contaminated with moisture or anything, we ask that you still put that in the recycle because it is um, better off being recycled first, primarily. Next. So again, we're focusing on organics because it's um, about 40% of the waste stream and a large portion of what ends up in the landfills. So if we can um, reduce a, a large portion of that, then that would be really helpful to what the, the pollutants that are being emitted. Next slide. So again, as previously mentioned, organics are about half of what Californians dump in the landfills. And by removing this aspect, it can greatly reduce our pollutants um, as well as uh, hopefully eliminate some potential health issues due to the air pollutants and things like that. And also in California, it is required by law. So everyone is slowly but surely getting to know more about it. Next. 
So we offer two different organics programs. We have the food waste only program and the mixed organics um, program. So food waste only is typically for commercial businesses and multifamily complexes. And mixed organics is typically what residents are utilizing. Next slide. So these are some of the uh, mixed organics uh, collection co containers. So we have carts and bins and depending on how much the generator is producing, um, we can uh, customize their sizes for them. Next slide. So um, for mixed organics processing, the reason why we have two different um, programs is because they're collected separately and they're processed separately. So for mixed organics, meaning yard waste and food waste combined, um, it is pre-processed at our facility. So this is where it is ground up. Um, in that first picture there, you'll see it being ground up in a grinder and um, that makes it easier to transport and also it's, it's like a pre-processing um, process essentially. So when it gets to the compost facility, it's already in that form. There they could lay it into rows um, where it's churned every couple of days to make nutrient soil for reuse. Next slide. Now for the food waste only program, as I mentioned, um, this is typically for commercial businesses, so a lot of restaurants. This is collected separately and processed differently. So these are some of the containers that we offer for the food waste only program. Next slide. So for food waste processing, we have this machine called the Scott Thor Turbo Separator. And this is where the food waste is pre-processed for compost as well. So the first step there is the bunker that you'll see where um, the food is, is dumped out on the tipping floor. It's placed into this bunker. It is then moved into this depackaging hopper where all packaging will be ripped away from it. In that lower left corner there, you'll see a hammer press. And this is where um, food waste is, the food is, is pressed through these small holes um, because there's a lot of moisture, it's able to be pressed through the small holes and then it creates this cake-like substance, as you'll see in that middle lower picture there. And then that is what's brought to the compost facility to also be churned for compost. Next slide. So one of the pillars that we discussed was in, um, inspection and enforcement requirements. So some of those things could um, include compliance reviews, and this is um, monitoring the success of the program and the implementation. Um, there's also route inspection, so we'll have a route auditor going out and flipping lids and um, and giving feedback to the generator if they're not utilizing the container properly. And then comes into play the notice of violations and penalties for violators. So typically most cities have about three, um, three tagging opportunities before they issue a violation, which is um, set at a minimum by the state and um, the notice is, uh, sorry, the, the fee is set by a minimum at the state. Next. Um, some of the challenges to implementation include a deadline bottleneck, meaning that um, everyone's competing for the same resources at the same time. So including um, staffing and uh, legal teams, things like that. Everyone's reaching for this, every, every hauler's competing for the same resources. Um, there's also the capacity bottleneck. Um, this is kind of referring to all haulers are competing for the same processing facilities and there's only so many available and it takes many, many years for a new processing facility to be permitted and opened. Um, resources, including staffing and equipment, this is including like drivers, trucks, um, bins, uh, sustainability advisors, things like that. 
Another thing is um, cities can be at different stages of implementation. So uh, basically, if people are communicating in different cities, they might not be at the same place depending on their city. So it can cause some confusion. Uh, customer's willingness to adapt behavior is a big thing if, if people aren't willing to change and, um, and implement this new, new um, step in their life, then, then there will be contamination, unfortunately. Um, so that's, that's kind of a problem is having our organics containers contaminated with things that aren't organic. Next slide. And then this is how we basically combat those things essentially is we're trying to get out there ahead of time and inform and educate everyone about the program, how to implement it and try to transition them easily. So we conduct education and outreach. We do that through things like newsletters. Um, we're always at community events with information booths. So come and talk to us if you have any questions. We have um, food waste pail giveaways as pictured in the corner up there. Um, we offer facility tours. If you're interested, you can come by and learn more about that. And um, we'll, uh, we will visit um, commercial sites to basically train their staff, give presentations, provide literature, anything else needed for that transition. Next slide. And that is all I have for you today. This is our contact information. If you have any questions, you can reach out to us. And thank you very much. You guys have been so awesome at not only giving us all that we need, but also doing it in such a like right on time. So appreciate that. So we'll 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 hold questions for Nina and Debbie until after Mike from CRNR speaks. And so please think of your questions. I know I have a couple in mind, but this was super helpful. Thank you very much, Nina, for for that. So then I want to turn it over now to Mike Carey, who's a senior sustainability manager for CRNR Waste Manage uh, Waste Services. So um, Mike, take it away. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, some of what I'm going to say is a little bit redundant of what Nina just presented because we're both kind of uh, fighting the same fight. We have um, a lot of the same strategies and are experiencing a lot of the same challenges um, industry-wide. So um, we somewhat do things a, a little differently. We have a different component for some of the organic waste, which we'll get into here in a minute. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit about CRNR. Um, whereas Republic is um, a, a national company, CRNR is more of a localized still um, local family owned and run company. Uh, we have over 2000 employees, 3.1 million customers and 50 municipal, 55 municipal contracts. So I'll show you some of the cities here in a minute that we represent. You can go to the next slide. Um, here are some of those cities. Some of them are in common over what Nina said. We do kind of compete with um, some of the other haulers in the commercial sector in some of our cities, in particular, I'm looking at this uh, Newport Beach, Costa Mesa, Irvine. I didn't put Irvine on there. We do a, a small component of the commercial um, facilities in Irvine. But these are all of the cities that I show up there are municipal residential contracts that we are currently doing. Um, next slide. Uh, Similar to what Nina presented, we were we have different strategies of how we um, put bins and carts at different facilities. The the larger generators, as uh, Nina mentioned, the larger restaurants, hotels, maybe uh, uh, schools, um, catering facilities. We could use a larger two yard food waste bin, like we're showing there. Um, for residential, we do carts like these and they are uh, co-collected as well. So it's the food waste and the organic and green waste in the carts. Um, similar to Republic, we're doing a lot of just food waste facilities for commercial and restaurant and they'll have a separate green waste or um, you know, landscaping container component to it. 
You can go to the next slide, please. Um, in addition to doing regular windrow composting, CRNR has invested a significant amount of resources into our anaerobic digestion facility, which you can see the rendering for here. This is located in Paris, uh, uh, California, not France, but it's up in out in Paris, a, a very interesting facility. Uh, go to the next slide. We can go a little more in depth into that. Um, the It's the largest and most advanced high solids anaerobic digestion facility in the world. It opened in 2017, 30 year lifespan. Um, we're currently operating phase one and two of that. You can see by the time uh, phase one and two, it was close to 60 or $75 million. Um, with combination of grant and funding by grants and funding by CRNR, um, we're working on opening phase three and four of that facility in the near future. Uh, next slide. This is kind of a flow chart of what happens with the organic waste when it comes to the facility. It goes into the main digester first, and then is um, uh, pumped and processed. Goes into the post digester and the um, digestible solids come out and are used as solid soil amendment. We also produce a liquid soil amendment and then process the gas that's created through the system um, through a gas upgrading stage one and then stage two. And then we pump that um, renewable gas back into the grid. We do use it to fuel our fleet of vehicles, and then um, um, we're not, how can I describe it? All of it that's coming out of the system goes into the grid, and we pull out what we need. So the amount of gas that we're putting into the grid is the same gas that you would be uh, utilizing elsewhere. Next slide. So I decided to cut the top portion of this oh. gas. Can um mute please? Here Thank is you. the top Can you portion please mute? of this cactus. So I cut somebody the... needs to mute, please. Thank you. There we go. Sorry about that, Mike. No, we're all good. Um, here are some of the benefits and and how much we are generating out of phase one and phase two of that facility. Over four million gallons of renewable natural gas and 260,000 tons of organic compost, which we do provide. Um, we provide that. Some of that material to Kellogg, who processes it and bags it. That's the same stuff that you would buy at Home, huh, excuse me, at Home Depot. And then we do distribute a significant portion of that through our compost giveaways as well. Um, as a matter of fact, we have. I hope it doesn't rain on Saturday. I have, I think, four different compost giveaways throughout the the county this Saturday. So hopefully it doesn't rain and we can get rid of some of this stuff. But um, if not, we'll save it and give it away in the spring. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we do, uh, as I mentioned, we do use some of that RNG to fuel our fleet of vehicles. Um, we have fueling stations in, out in Paris where the digester is in our San Juan Capistrano facility and Garden Grove. I, Put on there, actually, it's an older slide that Stanton and Colton are pending. Our Stanton fueling station is currently open. Uh, Colton should be any day now. Um, and 20 year station lifespan. Next slide. Yeah, you actually go back to that slide. You can see that's where the trucks come and park um, back at night and fuel up. Um, that would be a, a depiction of our. Garden Grove facility. Okay, go ahead, next slide. Um, the benefits of anaerobic digestion compared to landfilling and composting, it's a, I always like this slide because if you're just landfilling it, you can recover 75% of the energy as we're seeing in the local landfills that, that we have here in Orange County. Um, you can recover 75% of the emissions capture, but you're getting 0% of the nutrient recovery. Composting kind of flips out a little bit and does 0% energy recovery, 0% emissions capture, and 100% nutrient recovery. Uh, anaerobic digestion kind of ticks all of those boxes and it collects all of the energy emissions and nutrients. So it is an expensive system, but the, uh, the benefits um, 
are immeasurable. Next slide, please. So, um, like, oh, wait a minute, where'd the end go on my education? That's yeah. literally the last yeah. word that I want to, uh, oh, there it is on, on the bottom, but uh, yeah, education, I, we definitely spell that right at my place. Sorry about um, that. <laughs> no, it's, it, it, it may be me and not you, um, but the, we do educate with uh, both for residential and commercial. Um, yeah, all my last letters are flopping <laughs> off at the bottom. Um, um, and we're, we're doing it in three different languages, typically, uh, depending on the community. Um, uh, we do have another one in Korean. Um, this one's English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. We can provide these trainings for homeowners associations, for um, residential groups, groups like this, restaurants, um, any food generating facility. You can go to that next slide with the other letter, the G dropping off there. <laughs> we're, tra we're training people. We're consistent, um, at least. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but we're, uh, we do go out to restaurants and facilities um, and, and literally train the kitchen staff on what they can put in there, what the benefits are, um, why they should be doing it. And again, it's the law and giving them, breaking down those barriers that would inhibit them from successfully participating in the program. Um, from my standpoint, as you can see from my background, education is huge for me. So going out and doing these trainings or having the staff to do that um, is a great benefit. Uh, out of all the cities that I mentioned, that I highlighted at the beginning of the presentation, my role at CRNR is I manage the teams that, that represent these cities. So for each of the cities that I had shown and all of our other cities, we we have dedicated staff for each city. So I'll have, uh, depending on the city, that can be between one to, th in our case, one to three um, dedicated sustainability specialists that serve one city. So if um, um, the city of, let's say the city of Tustin, I have three sustainability specialists that serve the city of Tustin. Um, we have two for Newport Beach. Uh, Laguna Beach is going to be one of our new contracts. We're starting that in uh, July of 2024. And that will require two specialists as well. So we have dedicated teams dedicated to each city that will go out and, and do these trainings and workshops and so forth. And next slide. Eliminate. Oh, good. All the letters line up there. Um, eliminating contamination is kind of the big buzz right now, beginning in uh, a few weeks, January of 2024, um, uh, contamination monitoring and notifying is going to be a, a big craze. We, we're already out doing that. We have um, our sustainability specialists are going out, uh, like Nina mentioned, doing lid flips in residential neighborhoods. Uh, so we'll, my team will be out there at six o'clock in the morning trying to beat the trash truck, uh, looking in resident carts just to identify contamination. We're not digging through it and trying to bust you just yet but we're if we do notice you're not putting stuff in the right container you get a, at this point you get a nice little friendly hang tag saying oops you could have done a little bit better here's what went wrong and here's a ways to succeed in doing that um, we also do that for uh, our commercial accounts as well um, Beginning in 2024, as was mentioned, there does have to be a stronger enforcement component. And as Nina mentioned, it typically involves three different um, tags. Let's say, let's say we're talking about residential. Your first tag would be a maybe a yellow colored tag saying that you contaminated um, with no fines, no consequences at this point. Your second time witnessed at your home, you might get a red color tag uh, with some, I don't want to say stronger wording, but stronger encouragement to do the right thing. After the, the third violation, you may get a letter in the mail um, saying that you're contaminating. Your next time there will be a fine. And there does, per Cal Recycle and state regulations, there does have to be a fine associated with that. 
um, I don't think any of us as haulers really want to find anybody. I mean, it costs me more to go out and examine the carts and process the fine and do the paperwork and buy the tags and bill the customer. Um, nobody really wants that. We want to, I like the education component of it and um, just get the mandatory participation. And when I say contamination, if we're talking about residential, it's, it's not just minimal. You, if people always ask me, what if one of my neighbors comes by and throws an in and out cup in my organic spin? You're not going to get fined or penalized for that. The, the threshold for contamination is 25% of your, of your cart, of the contents of your cart. So you would have to be fairly egregious in um, the amount of non-participation that you're doing to be able to generate a fine like that. Um, many of our, most of our um, residential route characterizations, now those are different where we'll collect waste from an entire route. We'll do, for example, today's Thursday, my neighborhood's uh, picked up on Thursday. that We could pick up all of the materials from my neighborhood, take it back to our facility from that one truck and one route, dump it all out, and sort it. And if there's more than 25% contamination from that one route, everybody on that route would get a notice saying your area was um, observed having more than 25%. We're here to help. Here's some ways in which you as a whole route can, can improve. That's as opposed to the individual part audits that we're doing door to door. Next slide, please. And so here's a very egregious um, contamination. You would be getting a, a tag for that one that just looking at it looks more, you can see it's a green lid or a green bin there, but um, there's, that definitely looks more than 25% contamination. So um, in that previous slide, the one little plastic bag wouldn't generate um, great concern. This bin would be more concerned. Next slide, I think I'm done, there we are, whoops. Oh, I gave myself a demotion too, I, I put coordinator rather than manager. Pretend that's manager. Awesome, thank you There's so my much. Contact. My pleasure. Oh, so we have a ton of questions coming in and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just feed them to you because okay, I have to, we may not get to them all. So I wanna try to pick the ones that I think are gonna apply to, to most folks. And I'm going to be selfish and ask the first one myself. So that's mm -hmm. so um, you you talk about enforcement. I know in talking to my neighbors, not none of the ones I talked to were doing the food waste. They're doing yard waste because they don't have anywhere else to put that, but not the food waste. So um, is when you flip the bins when you're doing the um, compliance check, are you looking for wa food waste in there? Or are you looking to see if it's in the trash, or how does that work? Um, I don't know. Do you want to take it, Nina, or do you want me to? I don't want to hog up all the time. Um, from, from my aspect, we are looking for food. We are looking for food, absolutely. In the in the um, in the green bin, right? In the trash. We're, well, we're looking at it in the trash. To oh, see in the trash. Okay, got gotcha. Mistakenly put sense. it in the trash. Yep. 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 Good. Thank you. Um, okay, if you could put your, I see some hands raised, but if you could put your questions in the chat because we've got so many of them. Um, so the next one is uh, for both of you all, are thin um, compostable bags allowed in the green bin? And it looks like somebody answered it. I don't know who, who's answering these, but I hope um, I hope it's, it's okay that we, uh, I'll, let me just ask it anyway. Um, if not, what should people use to line their kitchen pails? Uh, from CRNR standpoint, we do accept the green compostable bags. You can also use uh, brown paper bags or line it with newspaper if you're talking about the kitchen food scrap pail, all of the above. Okay, thank you. And and how about from Republic? Yeah, so um, commercially, we accept um, we accept plastic bags to contain food waste only. But for residents and mixed waste programs, um, we don't accept compostable plastics or plastics of any kind. Um, so you can line your food pail with either newspaper 
or um, a, yeah, paper bag, things like that. And you can put um, your food scraps in the freezer or refrigerator for um, to contain the smells. That's what I recommend um, until your service day when you can then bring it out into the organic container. Okay, thank you. Um, is Republic compost operation in place in Huntington Beach? Um, and, th and then what about in apartments in Newport? So hi, I'm Debbie Killey. I'm the municipal sales manager. I work with Nina. I didn't give the presentation. I wanted her to do it tonight. Um, thank you. Uh, so I could answer that question. So we do not have organic composting in Huntington Beach at our site. Um, like Nina said, that Scott Thor that processes the commercial food waste, that is in, in Anaheim. And then our compost facilities are in Ontario and Oceanside. So that's where the material is going. And then we also have some facilities up in uh, Kern County. And then the other question was, any update on when food waste will be allowed in green bins in Huntington Beach? <laughs> <laughs> as, we, as we mentioned in our presentation, um, municipalities are at different um, phases of it. So with Huntington, we're still w working through the details of the program. There's a little bit more. It's a big city. And there's a lot of things to work out, some details. So we're hoping that by July of next year, we'll be able to implement that program there. But we're still discussing with the city. And the Newport Beach um, multifamily question. So like Mike said, we both do commercial in Newport Beach. So I'm not really sure that specific question, if it's a Feel free to reach out to me if it's a specific if, if Republic is your hauler, um, and I can answer more specifically what you're looking for. And, and then there's a well. question about um, how folks in different municipalities um, might know what they is permitted to be put in the green waste. What are the ways you guys are all communicating that? So, like Nina said and Mike said. The newsletters are going out. SB 1383 is part of the education and outreach pillar requires that that outreach is done on an annual basis to commercial and residents. So in Fountain Valley, we do have the program already in place and we send out a residential newsletter annually and we send out a commercial newsletter twice a year. So, Mike, I don't know if it varies by your cities, but. It, it is an annual requirement and that will, and you'll see social media posts, you'll see a set of events. So there's ways that we're getting that message out there. I think Mike, you're probably similar. Yeah, we employ similar strategies and it depends on the city and some of the cities, Newport Beach, for example, for residents requires a, a detailed recycling guide every year. We just distributed it and um, we do that for commercial as well. We make it clear of the what goes where and we try to label the cards and all of our outreach includes includes all that. We want to try and make it as easy as possible. Um, if I had one complaint about our industry in general is I don't like that the answer is it depends. Um, I, I wish as an industry, it was more clear for everybody. But okay, Good call, then, Mike. It gets confusing, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> All right, so CR and R, um, do CR R and R other facilities get RNG from Paris? Do, um, do other facilities get the RNG? So all of our facilities, um, now we have the capabilities you saw on the slide, we do have RNG at our Garden Grove facility where the majority of our trucks come from. We have it in Stanton, which is just a mile away from the garden, or maybe three miles away from the Garden Grove facility. And we're doing that in San Juan Capistrano as well. So the, our, our trucks have the opportunity to um, get the RNG from our facilities. Okay, thank you. And um, then I wanted to ask, um, because we're, we've got just a, a minute left, um, what can we do to help move this process along? So there's a lot of us who care a lot about not having methane go into the air. Um, and so are there things we can do? Because, you know, I know there's like tabling and there's some community outreach, but the, the folks I talk to don't really know anything about it. I think the the, the regular folks going on their day-to-day -day business who are not, aren't as passionate as probably the people on the call are, are don't know very much about it. What? How can we change that? Well, it, for me, it's probably isn't my company line, but um, I spent- That's okay, 40, we won't tell on you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I spent 40 years trying to um, 
put guys like me out of business. So the, the one thing you can do is consume less and not create any of the stuff that we have to pick up anyway. That's uh, from an individual basis. That's the number one thing you can do. It's just create less stuff that we have to get in process. Mm -hmm. About plastic, right? right, right. <laughs> okay. And Debbie or Nina, anything else to add on that? Yeah, it's hard to get that outreach. I know uh, tabling is great, especially I think Nina with Surf Rider. I think they do some things um, at different events. And for me, I, I don't probably for Nina and Mike as well. When I go to a dinner party or any, I'm always talking about recycling and organics and trash. So mm -hmm. I think you know if it's a topic, it's it's a topic of conversation. You know, you can encourage people, and you have more people. I don't know, I guess I maybe an 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of the population is good to go with it. You've got, you know, a small portion that is going to fight you tooth and nail. But mm -hmm. the more we we pick at them together as, as the entity, we can get them to reduce their waste and hopefully do the right thing with the material that they do generate. Yeah, my favorite success stories are when mm -hmm. the, the people that are the hardest to get to that are the most resistant when they finally do it. And then they come and tell you, you know, this is actually easier than I thought it was going to be. Not hard. So wow. true. <laughs> easy. Those are the little victories. That are yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go let us. I'm going to let us go over for just one more minute because I really it, like this last question, which is, it, can can we help as citizens to distribute oops mm -hmm. cards if we see highly contaminated <laughs> green waste cans? Yeah, and I'll just mention I asked that question because I had heard at some point of like citizen team that goes out and just educates not not like you're in trouble but just um you know street team or something does any of that exist there i can go ahead go ahead Dick. no you know and uh, mike i don't know if any of your cities have it i know the city of burbank has a master recyclers program and i would love to see that in some orange county cities where they have a group of warriors who are, you know, educating people. I would not suggest that uh, residents start tagging their neighbors' bins. <laughs> uh, we have. <laughs> I would leave that to us. We have to track uh, a first notice, second notice, third notice, just like Mike was saying with the different colored tags. So it really it could be confusing, but you know, if you if if you're brave enough to talk to your neighbor about it, go for it. <laughs> Well, maybe kind of a not your neighbors go to another city and do it. <laughs> oh, oh no, I wouldn't suggest it. I don't know, Mike, what you guys would say. <laughs> I, I was, there is a component of it where there should, where there's supposed to be a, anonymous notification. And I think we refer to it as narca neighbor, but again, I, I don't suggest that either. <laughs> That's true. I forgot about that. The uh, Cal yeah. Recycle has a, a place you can tell on someone on their website. <laughs> okay. Okay. It, uh, Susan, I just want to mention there were a few more slides that one of our members contributed that is kind of good information. Um, do you want me to share them real quick? Just yeah, and and guys, if you have to go, I know um, we'll respect that. No, uh, no harm, no foul. But yes, please. I, I'm yeah. curious. Okay, I'll just and share them. Thank you guys, Mike and Debbie and Nina. Yes. Yes. Thanks so much. I'm just there real quick, but they were some good resources. Um, uh, slide, sorry, slide from the current slide. Um, tips on separating food waste, right? It was just, um, you know, to avoid super wet food, uh, use a paper bag or line um, leftover newspaper and um, you know, cinnamon might be a good way to keep gnats away and please separate all your, all your food waste. Um, so, and then the next slide was um, just some facts about the OC landfills and you guys, if you, if this is not true, um, <laughs> I'll just let you read it, but uh, you know, I, I um, Susan consultants in the industry and she wanted to share this. Um, and then, uh, and then the last thing is free compost. I, Mike, you had mentioned that, but Monday through Saturday, seven to four p.m. at the Irvine and Brea landfills, um, gorgeous rich. So uh, I'm gonna take advantage of this one. 
and uh, I hope some of you do too. And then um, the last very important thing is if you want to help us, please put your email in the chat. You can also email us at climaterealityprojectoc at gmail.com and let us know you want to help us with our uh, or organic waste or all waste issues by joining our Green Living Committee and, uh, and help us with this important matter. And that is it. I'm going to stop sharing. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate your time um, and all the good information. Hopefully we continue to chip away at this quickly. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Recording. Thinking of um, the chat.